Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Я просто дам маленькое вступительное слово. Меня зовут Ярослав Фаловод. Я один из кураторов Музея современного искусства Гараж. My name is Yaroslav Fulovod, and I am one of the curators of the Garage Museum. I'm happy to greet everyone who is here for the first time, and I want to welcome our regular visitors. I wanted to say a couple of words about these three great talks. In the context of what we do, as we know, the Garage Museum has a huge exhibition and educational programs. And recently, quite recently, we started to diversify the uh, visitor's experience. We have a great department who reinvests their own competences, and quite recently they started to include people with migration experience into our audience members. And as you probably know, quite recently we saw a big retrospective of Rashid Arain, uh, an important Pakistani artist, and we also collaborated with the uh, with the people who have uh, migration experience. We also collaborated with the uh, St. Petersburg artists uh, who rethink the migrants from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. So we are very happy to welcome these three talks here, three talks dedicated to urban Muslim spaces. They, uh, they share a kind of a trans-national approach. I think it's really crucial, it's very important in the context of our global focus on the review of the international history of art. As you probably know now, uh, all over the world people are reviewing the art narratives and the art narratives now include not only Moscow, Paris, New York but also they start these narratives start to include the so-called uh, the global south so now the current perspective is that of inclusion and now more attention is focused on the artists and on the communities that live beyond uh, the United States of America and Europe. I'm happy to pass the mic now to the speakers. Thank you very much for coming. Hopefully it will be a fruitful evening for you. Hello, I will say just a couple of words. I'm very happy to welcome you all here. My name is Dmitry Aparian and I work at the uh, Department of History at the High School of Economics and I focus on Muslim studies and migration studies and quite recently at the High School of Economics to, to get an colleague we held a big workshop. Uh, I, the uh, mobility and translocality of the Muslim identity in between the post-Soviet space, Europe and Turkey. And I'm very grateful to the Garage Museum, really. Thank you very much for this opportunity. The Garage Museum is one of the few venues where you can present academic studies, where you can publicly present academic studies. It's really important to carry out this academic uh, talk uh, beyond the walls of the university. We just recently hosted this workshop in the High School of Economics. The venue was uh, the university. It was very academic. It was held uh, during the work days at date time, but it's very important to share anthropological and research questions with the broader public. And I think the Muslim studies is really something really crucial. Urban studies is also something really crucial. Now I'm really grateful to the Garage Museum, to the High School of Economics, uh, the School of Sociology, for them supporting this workshop, which we just hosted at the High School of Economic, Economics. And I want to say thank you to Henrik Böll's foundation and personally Marie Vatikova for their uh, help and also the Department of uh, Sociology and the Embassy of uh, Germany in Russia. Thank you very much. It's very important that Moscow now hosts these discussions. It's really important that we raise these questions in Moscow. Moscow, a city that can boast a really rich Muslim history and has a lot of Muslim heritage, which is unknown to many people. And currently we have a big Muslim community. Also, it's really important to talk not only about Moscow, not only about Russia. And today we are going to talk about a really broad geography. Uh, the talks will focus on different countries and different spaces. They will include uh, Central Asia, uh, Beirut, the Balkans, uh, 
Dubai, Beirut. So this is really a broad geography of our discussion tonight. And I'm happy to invite Manja Stefan Emrich from uh, an expert from Germany. She works at Humboldt Universität in Berlin. She focuses on uh, Muslim studies. Uh, she uh, works uh, with uh, uh, with different aspects of them. She focuses on women, on the female history, and she will talk about different facets about a particular facet of your studies. That's uh, the tragic mi migration to Dubai. As we think. Moscow, Russia, is a big hub for the Tajik community. So a lot of people from Tajikistan migrate to, Mos migrate to Moscow, but actually they also do so to the Arab Emirates, South Korea, Kazakhstan. So the world is much broader than we think. Mania, the floor is yours. All the talks will be in English. If you need simultaneous translation, please take the headsets for simultaneous translation right here. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome and thank you very much um, for the introduction, Dima, and for the invitation and for having me here in this um, wonderful place and uh, this wonderful uh, lecture series. Um, the paper that I'm going to, um, to hold today uh, is a contribution, uh, as a contribution to this evening lectures which deal with um, urban Muslim places, is a topic which is rarely studied uh, in, um, in the context, of, as Dima already said, in the context of a migration from uh, Central Asia, because it focuses on um, Central Asian migrants in, in the Gulf and particularly in, um, in Dubai. My current research addresses the growing field of entangled economic and religious relations that has been reconnecting Muslim societies in Central Asia with the Gulf, particularly since the 2000s, and I say reconnecting because um, there is a long history of connectivity and mobility between these two regions, of course. <clears throat> this spatial religious uh, economic assemblage, which I call the Tajik Dubai business, has been producing new ideas about Islam, new forms of public piety, as well as new urbanities that circulate between the Gulf and Central Asia. And this assemblage has also produced um, a wide range of traveling images and material representations that underline the new image um, of the Emirates and Qatar, Kuwait and Oman as a trans-regional hub for the production of a new post-Western urban modernity. And how these spatial ideas and images um, are linked to urban Muslim space and place is what I will discuss today in my paper. So let me start with some images uh, that allow us to track how Dubai is materially represented uh, in Tajikistan in particular in Tajikistan's public sphere. So the first two images um, are street advertisements in the capital city of Dushanbe. On the right, uh, you can see the, um, a national bank that offers credits for conspicuous consumption among the new urban middle class in the country, luxury car in combination with luxury holiday destinations. And on the left, um, a tourist company advertisement that presents Dubai as a halal travel destination for Russian-speaking Muslim uh, visitors and that also stresses Sharia compliance in combination with shopping tours and family-friendly holidays. <coughs> there is additionally a growing field of trading and business connections between Dubai and Tajikistan that includes the circulation of luxury consumer goods such as humors, communication technology, and of course also Islamic fashion. And the flow of Gulf money is also changing the religious landscapes in the urban, not only in the urban, but also or even more in the rural areas of Tajikistan. Accordingly, this image, the third image, shows a so-called Arab mosque, uh, constructed particularly in, uh, in the surroundings of the capital city, uh, Dushanbe, and with the money of wealthy Tajik Dubai businessmen who became inspired by the lavish charity performances of the Emirates' new bourgeoisie 
and who invest their wealth, their newly gained wealth, in the publicly visibly materiality of a progressive transnational Islam. In a more symbolic sense, we can also observe the travel of Dubai's image as a progressive, hypermodern global city in recent urban plannings that feeds into state-led agendas of national heritage making and in combination with the reconstruction of the post-socialist capital city, which condenses in processes of worlding, closely related to the Dubaization or galvanization of urban landscapes in Central Asia's capital cities. So, and here you see Diyara Dushanbe, which is a project uh, financed by DR Qatar. <coughs> And this is a multifunctional housing complex entailing business, living, entertainment, shopping areas, and this is under construction in uh, the capital city of Tajikistan. So, <clears throat> starting from here, what are we going to talk about today? Um, I will introduce you a little bit about the Tajik Dubai business as a trans-regional space of cross-border economic activities that has been booming since the late 1990s, early 2000s. And um, I will talk about how the Tajik Dubai business produces and mediates the idea of Dubai as a particular and ideal Muslim place. Although place and space are closely related, my focus will be more on place. How Tajik migrants make sense of Dubai as an ideal Muslim place in which they work, live, and how and live. And also how they define the Muslimness of this place how they embody the idea of Dubai as a Muslim place through forms of work, lifestyles, and performative piety. The paper is also a little bit about being Muslim in Dubai, where I do, whereas I do understand Dubai as a heterotopian space in which different cosmopolitan settings and realities are produced. Finally, uh, my paper takes a translocal approach, translocality approach, it means it follows a little bit um, the migrants, their stories, biographies, and the things, the consumer goods they engage with, trade with, as part of what I describe, what is described in the literature as Dubaization or galvanization. So, <clears throat> Gulf migration from Tajikistan has been flourishing since the 1990s, as I said, and has to be understood as embedded in larger reconfigurations of different forms of mobility and connectivities between not only Central Asia and the Middle East, but also Europe and in particular Russia, because many Tajik migrants first go to Russia and from Russia they move, move further to Dubai. <clears throat> This reconfiguration, which combines work migration, student travel for Islamic knowledge to Cairo, for example, the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca and tourism and the like, um, this reconfiguration of post-Soviet mobilities centers around the idea of Dubai as a part of Arabistan. This is an imagined and utopian place associated by Tajik migrants with true and authentic Islam and with the idea of living a good Muslim life abroad. So, and um, the, the paper is part of my current research project in which I trace how university trained, high skilled, urbanized, and multi language speaking young Tajik Muslims engage in transnational Islam through Gulf migration. The main focus is on the intersection of religion, consumer capitalism, and new middle class sensibilities. And I'm particularly interested in the refashioning of migrant identities through their involvement in cosmopolitan Muslim business networks in Dubai that allow Tajik migrants to engage in morally broad, in proper um, projects of spiritual, moral, and social uh, progress of course, also an economic process, progress. <clears throat> the, um, the way the Tajik migrants are involved in global middle-class consumerism can be best described through the business they do. So, some of them trade with uh, luxury commodities, fur coats, spare parts for SUVs, modern communication technology, modern cladding for housing, um, fashionable hijabs, which are branded as Dubai styled or Dubai commodities, Dubaiski style. 
So other migrants are active in the Russian tourism business and offer guiding trips to shopping malls, the Indian Ocean, the desert, and um, all of the places Russian new urban middle classes is thrilled to visit uh, when in the Gulf, and of course also the, the fur coat shops where many Russians uh, go and, 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 and buy a fur coat to bring home. Combining their skills in speaking Farsi, Russian, and Arabic, many Tajiks are able to work in mid, uh, as middlemen, linking Dubai's cargo trading business with that of tourism. While the majority of Tajik migrants in Dubai start their career with undocumented street work as brokers, I think that was the one picture, this guy. <clears throat> so inviting uh, tourists to come to the four coat shops and trying and then maybe get a commission when, uh, when they, they buy one or two of these four coats. Um, so, this undocumented street work is one career path um, which is undocumented and makes them vulnerable for deportation by the Emirates police. Other Tajiks, however, make, it, uh, make their career path via the middleman activities and get formal employment in a forecourt shop or in a, in, a, in a mobile phone shop and are thus able to reside for longer period, time periods than a tourist visa might allow. And they are then able to bring their families or to buy an apartment and to bring their families to the Emirates. So, <coughs> okay, yes. And although Tajik's idea of progressing in Dubai's business sector is pinned to formal labor, they enjoy their informal working status because it offers them more freedom and more individual autonomy to operate and move between different business fields. As traders, middlemen, and business people, they move freely in Dubai's city space and cross the territorial border of the Emirates in flexible and highly creative ways, in contrast to the many other Asian, or Asian contrast, contract workers in the Gulf, and they are thus able to engage in rather cosmopolitan global Muslim identity discourses and I will introduce this now so but maybe first of all some thoughts on placemaking in a nutshell the concept of placemaking emphasized the active process of generating or remaking the world people inhabit through social practices and relations related to place and space just as an example, Thomas Street, for example, an anthropologist, associates placemaking with dwelling, that is mapping, building, and inhabiting as various, various scales. Vasquez and Not put emphasis on aspects of crossing, that is placemaking is interrelated with mobility and with circulation. Sita Lau, among others, stresses the involvement of the body, embodied placemaking, and therewith invites us to rethink the link between emotion, affect, and space. In mobility and diaspora studies, however, placemaking is related to how migrants reshape the built environment of cities, how they become visible in the urban landscape through, oops, uh, how they become visible in the urban landscape through, for example, ethnic restaurants, cultural centers, ethnic food stores, and the like. If you turn to Dubai, it is interesting that Tajiks are rather invisible in the urban landscape. While the lack of material manifestations of the Tajik migrant community in Dubai speaks for some kind of missing institutionalization of migration to the Gulf, their invisibility is at the same time an economic strategy, in particular for those who are involved in undocumented world, or in undocumented work in order to protect them from street raids and deportation, yeah? Because they are not recognized as Tajik or Central Asian migrants by the police. Speaking like Arabs, dressing like Arabs, as this guy here behind me, is not only a strategy of camouflage, but is related also to their self-fashioning as Muslim business people. It means 
fashioning a work identity that helps them to overcome their vulnerable status as a migrant worker. And this became very obvious in the often heard statement, we do not, we, we, we are not migrants, we do business. So, and another argument that make out of this invisibility, which is really interesting uh, in comparison to, for example, the Tajik migrant community um, in Moscow. Yeah, they are really very, very uh, visible. Another argument is um, that <clears throat> this kind of invisibility or camouflage and uh, speaking like Arabs, dressing like Arabs, is also um, an, an, an hint or and gives insight into Tajik migrants' cultural competence to maneuver cultural, ethnic, and religious diversity, or to put it differently, Tajiks uh, perform a kind of Arabness and as such a form of Muslim belonging through which they engage in a cosmopolitanism which is a social reality and the kind of business culture. So um, turning from place, from, from the work of placemaking and uh, doing business to the work, um, to doing imagination work, I would like to say a little bit about why Dubai is um, experienced or sensed of as a Muslim place. The described work experience in the informal business sector heavily feed the idea of Dubai as a Muslim place to work and live because, and there is a kind of a highly romanticized and idealized image um, of Dubai that circulates among the, the community in Dubai, but also in, in, um, among Tajiks um, stayed or left behind at home. So this image covers a good mosque infrastructure, also mosques for women, that allow to combine work and piety or to integrate work as a form of worship, something that is not possible for Tajiks um, in, in Tajikistan due to the strict regulations of religious practice in, in, the, in the urban public, and also because due to the limited mosque structure. And Dubai has also offers many study educational centers, Muslim endowments and charity, um, yeah, places sponsored by the state that allow Tajik migrants to engage, for example, in Islamic education for free. And there is a growing consumer market for Muslims, halal food, and um, they are also relatively close Muslim neighborhood when it comes to housing. So many Tajiks prefer to, to, to live in, um, in so kind of not gated communities, but um, communities where that are predominantly, um, yeah, you can see predominant populated by Muslims. And um, eventually Dubai is valued also for the Muslim friendly working conditions. Doing business with Muslims offer all, offers opportunities for doing proper work, which is trade, to teach that, because trading does not force people to involve in corruptive practices, as it is the case in Tajikistan. So this is what uh, my um, research partners often told me. So trade is the best work you can do. And this was only one, also one reason why Tajik migrants often fashioned their migration to Dubai as Hijra. So as a kind of religious emigration because of the living conditions. So it means for, for Tajiks, Dubai is a kind of dreamscape, a spatial manifestation of a religious, of a religious utopia that combines, combines uh, the idea of urban progress with corruption-free business, a just society that fosters social equality and the sense of dignity as Muslim, um, fostered by an authoritarian form of Islamic governance. Therewith, Dubai serves as an antidote to secular realities at home, as well as to difficult, difficult situations many Tajiks also face or as Central Asian migrants in Russia. So, and maybe to sum up, <coughs> And uh, yeah, my main arguments. Um, the first is that Tajiks involved in Dubai's trading and tourism business sectors engage in projects of place and space, sorry, of, in projects of place and self-branding by creating, advertising, and consuming the idea of Dubai as a hyper-modern, progressive, cosmopolitan, and global urban space, Muslim space. 
the related material representations of Dubai through the luxury consumer goods they trade with or through their body performance, clothing style and transnational habitus, merge ideas of a global modern urbanism with notions of progress and prosperity, cosmopolitanism, um, into an entrepreneurial Dubai Islam that in a sensational way associate Dubai with the political, programmatic, brandish and utopian geographical entity of the Arabian Gulf. So, which is represented by, for example, this. Interesting in this context, however, is that in Dubai, Tajik migrants merely move in and between Persian-speaking uh, business networks and not Arabic-speaking speak networks. And they would link themselves to the, the cosmopolitan trading history of the Persian Gulf. Tajik speak Farsi or Tajiki, a Persian language. Obviously, placemaking happens in an urban setting that forms part of what spatially imagined, is spatially imagined as Arabistan, but is realized through Persian-speaking business networks. So, yeah. <clears throat> the next argument is linked with the rather hysterical discussion on uh, or sensed Arabization or Wahhabization of Islam in Tajikistan. This is part of the government's security discourses that criminalizes Muslims mobile between Tajikistan and the Middle East as dangerous subjects importing a foreign Islam not compatible with the state-led interpretation of a national home ground Islam. As a response, as a critical response to this discussion, I rather prefer to speak of a Dubaization of the Muslim imagination in Tajikistan which I conceptually grasp as a process of a material mediation happening on the ground, rather than on the level of political economy. This Dubaization creates religious bricolage or assemblage that merge different religious traditions and practices. It means elements from Sufi Persian Islam with Salafi doctrine and trans-regionally circulating discourses of Islamic reform according to the multiple ethnic and uh, culturally mixed um, business networks Tajiks involve in Dubai. So, how much time do I have? Still? Okay, then I will skip it a little bit. Yeah. So, Understanding um, material mediation as the way people relate to the world and the world which is full of desires, dreams and aspirations related to middle class sensibilities and understanding religion as a practice of material mediation. We could also argue that the constructing, advertising and consuming of Dubai as a certain Muslim place is a pathway for migrants into middle class status. The Dubaization of Muslim imagination and sentiments involve Tajik migrants in middle-class sensibilities, which are global, cosmopolitan, and post-national, rather than oriented toward, towards Taj Tajik citizenship. Or to put it differently, in Dubai, Tajiks engage in reform-minded entrepreneurial piety, which is loaded with middle-class aspiration and post-national sentiments. So... Okay, and Dubaization, maybe I should say a word about the term, because originally it describes how the blueprint of Gulf urbanism is increasingly being adopted in other parts of the Arab and the Islamic world and um, beyond. And I follow those scholars who have argued that processes of coping and adapting and adopting and reflecting Dubai elsewhere can happen in very different ways and in very different spheres, including religion. And um, I also use Dubaization as a term to designate a kind of cultural hegemony in the sense that the money, the culture, and the bourgeois lifestyle of Emirati Arabs, together with the branding strategies of the Emirates government, are taking over the imagination uh, the desires and the aspirations of Tajik Muslims abroad and in Tajikistan. So, yes, and I come to my, um, to my last part. 
and to a case study by which I will illustrate uh, what I mean with this cultural hegemony uh, issue. And this is a small ethnographic vignette from my fieldwork in Tajikistan. The case study nicely illustrates the translocal dimension of Tajik Dubai migrants' life worlds and their involvement in the process of producing Dubai as a certain Muslim place. So the focus is on how migrants embody, perform, and dare with index the idea of Dubai as a modern, progressive, and cosmopolitan urban place. So um, anthropological works on Gulf migration from India shows how Indian migrants claim belonging to the cosmopolitan trading heritage of the Gulf by engaging in kitchen cosmopolitan particularities. And here I speak of women. The way Indian Gulf migrant women cook, the kitchen appliance they use or the way they furnish the houses is an expression of an exclusive cosmopolitan and urban Gulf identity the women use as a cultural resource to differentiate themselves from other Muslim women in their village or uh, in their uh, urban neighborhood. I borrowed a term to describe how Tajik migrant women represent themselves as the wives of successful and pious Dubai businessmen in their home community. During my fieldwork in Tajikistan, I was invited in a couple of such gather of women's gatherings, including relatives and women from the neighborhood. These gatherings served as a space for displaying the migrant's Dubai way of life. Also, these gatherings served as a space for narrating stories of progress that link economic with spiritual success. As you can see on this slide, Tajik women who host these gatherings cook Arab food. They present the latest Dubai fashion or the kitchenware and the furniture styles they bought in Dubai shopping malls or copied from other migrant women they regularly visit in the neighborhood of their housing blocks in the Emirates. Also, the women um, of Tajik Dubai businessmen decorated their lost latest smartphones with Islamic motifs, presented ringtones with Islamic prayer calls, or they showed photos from the Mecca pilgrimage uh, they stored in their digital smartphone archives. Obviously, these Dubai commodities were presented in a highly sensational way and thus trigger feelings of desire and longing to belong to something larger, which is the global Muslim middle class. This Dubai, Dubaiization at the making, as I call it, again is a kind of hegemony which conflates migrants' consumer aspirations with religious sensibilities. And as a last point, this ethnographic vignette also nicely illustrates how Tajik Dubai migrants connect the materiality of Arab culture and the bourgeois Arabic lifestyle with the notion of an elitist, progressive urban Islam. When this economically successful women state that in Dubai they also became international and Islamic women, they display a cosmopolitanism, a Muslim cosmopolitanism, which transcends local Muslim identities associated with national culture and a rather backward rural way of life in opposition to the, to the progress they experienced in Dubai. So, and against the background that Tajiks, because of or Tajikistan, because of their imagined remoteness or peripheral uh, location in the wider Muslim world, are often portrayed and um, associated or, or seen as rather passive uh, in the context of globalization. It means um, they play only a marginal role. I, argue, um, I would like to argue the opposite. When Tajik migrants make Dubai a Muslim place, they actively engage in cultural and economic globalization and try to become part of something larger. A dream Dubai's political elite currently also tries to realize with their futurist, fut futurist narratives um, when it comes to urban plan planning. So, thank you very much for your attention. Dear ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, or what should we, maybe we should leave the questions till the end.
Uh, yeah, I think it makes sense. Let's leave all the questions till the end because otherwise we won't have enough time to listen to all the talks. So, sorry, I changed my mind now. Let's uh, organize the q and session at the very end. At the end, we'll have a discussion, questions, comments, everything. So, I will remind you again that we have simultaneous translation into Russian and we have a person over the air in the booth translating into Russian. So, if you have some doubts or or you don't understand something because um, for the speakers, the English is not their native tongue, so if you don't understand something, please don't hesitate to take the headsets for the simultaneous translation, and we have a great interpreter who's doing her best to translate everything uh, that is being said. And I'm happy to introduce Jeremy Walton with his big and quite difficult uh, talk about the Balkans, about uh, the history and the heritage and uh, how this heritage can be understood and rethought now. Jeremy Walton works at Max Planck Research Group, leader in Empires of Memory. Uh, in Göttingen, and his focus is uh, on the Osman and Axberg empires in the history and in contemporaneity. So, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Is this on? Uh, it is on. I tend to speak a bit too loudly anyhow, so I hope you'll bear with me. Dobry večer, spasibo na moj slušat. That probably sounds more Serbo-Croatian than Russian, but I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank both Garage and, uh, and Dima and also Lily for the kind invitation to speak here this evening and also to participate in the workshop over the past few days. It's really been a uh, multifaceted and productive time. It's also always a joy to return to this incomparable city of Moscow. And although I will be speaking about three mosques, not Moscow, but mosques in, uh, in the Balkans, I do hope, oh, goodbye, Jesko. Uh, I, I do, <laughs> he, ha, he has a very early flight this morning. You'll have to forgive him. Uh, 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 I do hope that you'll see how some of the, the approach that I am trying to broach uh, in this presentation and indeed in my project uh, at the Max Planck Institute, as, as Dima uh, noted more generally, might have some resonance and, and pertinence uh, to the landscapes of Moscow, the spaces and places, both religious and otherwise, that, that one finds in this city. Uh, so uh, uh, unlike, uh, unlike Manya, I will, for the most part, speak uh, less formally, but I will begin by reading some text, uh, and then uh, I will, in a sense, uh, hopefully with inspiration from the slides that I provided for myself and you, speak uh, uh, at a, at a, at a less, uh, le in a less structured manner after that. But I will read to begin with, and we'll see how this goes. So, I walk into the mosque. Despite the soaring dome above, the enclosed space intensifies the muggy heat of the late summer day. Approximately a hundred men and boys sit on the hodgepodge of prayer rugs that covers the floor. Twenty or thirty women occupy raised platforms to the right and left of the entry. Excuse me, I have to read, which means that I have to find my place in the sentence. <laughs> Some members of the congregation offer whispered prayers, while others sit subdued, languid. The mosque's elongated stained glass windows, each a multicolored arabesque, kaleidoscopically filter the midday sunshine. A paunchy middle-aged man rises laboriously, stands at the microphone, and begins to intone the esan, the call to prayer, prior to Juma, the Friday congregational prayer. I walk into a mosque. Above, a poster depicts a stylized image of a young man with a well-groomed mustache, probing eyes, low brow, and dark hair. On the facade of the building, a neon sign reads, Nikola Tesla, mind from the future. Once inside, I pause to pay the entry fee before exploring the exhibition, which combines biographical artifacts, a loose timeline of Tesla's life, and contemporary sculptures that attempt to render his epiphanies in, art, in an artistic medium. 
I walk into a mosque. Two signs create disorientation. The first in Ottoman Turkish and Italian offers the date of construction and the architect's name, Vitaliano Poselli. The second in Greek reads, Archaeological Museum. The interior of the mosque is empty. Several black panels displaying amateurish ink drawings contrast with the original architectural ornamentation of the building, including the mihrab and an elegant calligraphic rendering of the Quranic phrase Bismillah Rahmani Rahim in gold leaf paint. My only company that day is outside. A crawl of tortoises, tortoises wandering between the Hellenic era marble tombstones scattered helter-skelter in the courtyard. So, what is a mosque? I think I'll pause just long enough for us to consider that question, and that's essentially what I want to raise for us to reimagine and rethink uh, this evening, because I, my sense is that there's a taken-for-granted understanding of what a mosque is that most of us in this room could probably provide, uh, most simply, a Muslim space of worship, those more familiar would probably add to this definition with the orientation in, in, in the cardinal directions toward Mecca, the presence of a mihrab. They might, you might make a distinction between larger congregational mosques that host Friday prayers and smaller, uh, smaller, smaller masjids, smaller sites of worship. You might talk about minarets as an architectural feature. And yet, as I've tried to suggest through these three opening anecdotes, each taken from three of my sites of, of research in uh, respectively, let's remember where we've been, Banja Luka in Republika Srpska, or the independent Republic, Serbian Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Zagreb in Croatia, and finally uh, Thessaloniki in Greece, it's not always terribly obvious what a mosque is, particularly when we take into account the divergent and multiform histories and, more importantly, in the context of this research and, and this presentation, memories that these sites materially embody. So one of my interventions throughout my project and in this small presentation as well is to incorporate a, a whole body of scholarship recently on the notion of sites of memory as pioneered by the French, uh, the French theorist Pierre Norois, to think about mosques. And it's these three examples when we think through this notion of sites of memory, and you can see something uh, along uh, one of the sort of long-winded uh, definitional passages from Nora behind me. When we really think through it, I think we come to a more textured and more place-specific understanding of what mosques can be. And I want to thank Manya for introducing the distinction between space and place because it also plays a role in my own presentation, although uh, somewhat differently. Essentially what I'm arguing that is that as abstract, uh, and uh, things get confusing here because often the space-place dichotomy is differently defined by different theorists, but as abstract types of places, mosques have a general definition as Muslim sites of worship, places for prayer, places for congregation on Fridays. Also, architecturally, there is some general notion, though I think I want to destabilize that, as you'll see. But as specific embodied places, they always inhabit and, 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 and often exhibit these multiple layered collective memories, always subject to political and, and other forms of mediation, especially material mediation, and that's what I'm getting at here. So I'm going to move on and tell you a little bit more about the three sites that we've already visited, and then conclude with a few more general remarks about how we might understand a mosque, given the sort of interventions that I'm trying to make. So, oh, I, I forgot to mention, though, that I did want to give you uh, uh, insight into the broader project of which this is merely one facet, one tip of, of, of several different icebergs, I suppose you might say. As, uh, as Dima kindly mentioned, I lead a research group at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity, a very long and somewhat unwieldy name in getting in, in Germany. Our research is devoted to, in some sense, excavating and 
ventriloquating the legacies and collective memories of the Habsburg and Ottoman empires, of course, both bygone empires, they ended at the same time with World War I, but the way that these memories and legacies and indeed also forms of erasure and amnesia continue to exist in the present in a broad geography from Central, from central Europe all the way to Anatolia, eight cities, uh, eight cities anchor our project, I like to remove the national boundaries just uh, because I think it's uh, productively, performatively effective that way. Uh, Vienna, Budapest, Trieste, Zagreb, Belgrade, Sarajevo, Thessaloniki, and Istanbul are the primary sites of our research, though we do conduct research at a whole variety of other cities, some of which you see here. I don't even include Banja Luka, which I discuss in this presentation. I should have put it on the map. But that's just to give you a sense of the broader, uh, the broader project and, and research agenda of which this is a part. Uh, so in some sense, that's a brief parenthesis before moving back to the three sites that we're discussing this evening. So the first mosque that we visited, which indeed I introduced in a rather, you might say, typical fashion. I was attending Friday prayer there. I described a scene that might be characteristic of mosques in many different parts of the world. And yet, as I want to tell you a bit now, and those of you who so kindly joined us for the workshop over the past few days have already heard a somewhat longer version uh, of this history and tale of ambivalent memory at the Ferhadie Mosque in Banja Luka. It's a site of intense, uh, intense and often ambivalent collective memories, despite also being an active space of congregational prayer for a community of Muslims, like a mosque in, in many other places. So Ferhadie was the, and is now again, the primary and iconic Ottoman era mosque in the city of Banja Luka, again, the largest city and capital of the Republika Srpska in Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was uh, viciously uh, and cynically destroyed during the war of 19, well, it was in 1993. The war, of course, lasted from 1992 to 1995. You can see an image of its destruction there on the uh, my, my right, your left, I suppose it is. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, now it has been rebuilt. Uh, the process of rebuilding, as I discussed at some greater length yesterday, has itself been often frustrated and, and marred by acts of violence. But as of 2016, it is functioning again, and it has been reconstructed in the exact form that it had prior to its demolition in 1993. Indeed, there was quite a premium placed on the authenticity and, and and, and yes, the authenticity and exactitude of that recreation, which was quite important, as I discussed yesterday. One of the aspects of this mosque, though, that is both provocative and in many ways, I think, problematic, is that beyond the community of Bosniaks who now practice Islam on a daily basis there, it's also a key site of memory for the Turkish state. Uh, it was funded by the Turkish Development Accord and Cooperation and Development Agency, known as TIKA. Here on the left, my left anyhow, you see the opening prayer at the mosque, which featured the participation of the prime minister at the time uh, from, uh, from President Erdogan's uh, AKP party. This is Ahmet Davutoglu, one of the architects of neo-Ottoman foreign policy for Turkey in the area, as well as the head of the Turkish Diyanet, or the the state agency for the organization and regulation of Islam in Turkey. So even as the Muslims who now inhabit Ferhadia remain quite ambivalent and often even silent in relation to the violence of the recent past, as a site of memory for actors elsewhere, namely the Turkish state, this becomes a sign of a sort of newly robust neo-Ottoman uh, geography and cartography. In my presentation yesterday, I discussed some of the more militant versions of this, which sadly we've seen recently in northern Syria, a very political context that I would be happy to comment on in the question and answer. But now I want to move to the second mosque that I introduced to you at the beginning of uh, of my essay. This is uh, a structure in Zagreb, which is my sometime hometown. I invite you all to join me there sometime if you happen to find yourself in Croatia. 
It was initially designed not as a mosque. Uh, in the 1920s, it was designed indeed as a monumental space to none other uh, than uh, King, I'm going to get this wrong, I believe it was King Alexander Karadjordjevic of the Serbian dynasty who was ruling uh, the kingdom of Yugoslavia, previously the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes at the time, designed by the premier Croatian sculptor and artist Ivan Mestrovic uh, as part of a South Slavic uh, uh, sort of uh, glorification for the newly independent state uh, of South Slavs after the end of the Habsburg Empire. For a whole variety of reasons, the project was troubled. It eventually did open, though, in the 1930s as an art pavilion. Then came World War II. And as you probably know, or many of you may know, Croatia was ruled during World War II by a fascist puppet state allied with the, uh, the Nazis. Uh, it was known as the, uh, the independent state of Croatia and uh, led by the sort of mini Mussolini Ante Pavlic. Due to a series of racial and civilizational theories uh, by a previous Croatian nationalist named Ante Starcevic, Pavlic decided to recruit Bosniaks as, in fact, Muslim Croats, and in order to recruit them, he decided to transform the Mestrovic Pavilion in Zagreb into a mosque. There you have an image of it during World War II as a mosque. It only functioned as a mosque for some three to four years, when, of course, Tito and the partisans returned to town, and things changed quite quickly. And yet, still today, this, this building and this area in the city is referred to as Jamia, as mosque. And so, living in the vernacular speech of Zagreb residents today is a trace of this mosque that I often, uh, in a typical anthropological way, poke at in order to see what kind of responses and what kind of memories it can evoke. There's much more to say about this building, too, and I hope to write a longer essay about about it. Most interestingly, perhaps, was that uh, after its uh, cessation as a mosque in 1945, it became the Museum of the People's Revolution. Uh, there were several, of course, in Yugoslavia, but this was the, the Zagreb-based one. But in the 1990s, it was returned to the Croatian Society of Artists, for whom it had originally been, uh, been devoted in the 1930s. And when they were conducting restorations, they managed to find many of the decorations that had been plastered over, but not uh, decorated is not the right word, but Quranic script in Arabic and so forth that had been plastered over but not entirely erased. I'm not sure what the state of that is now. I mean, you can't see them if you go and visit a Tesla exhibition there, but it is still this palimpsest of what you might call uh, pasts, some of which are more available to collective memory than others. Uh, I'm probably speaking at too great a length, but I do want to tell you a bit more about the third site we visited. This is the Yeni Jami in uh, Thessaloniki, Greece. Now, some history here is also necessary. Thessaloniki Salonika was one of the principal port cities of European, uh, of the European half or section of the Ottoman Empire, quite vibrant, quite multi-religious, uh, 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 like many port cities, a, a seat of both social and, uh, and linguistic and ethnic and cultural plurality throughout the Ottoman times, only to be rendered relatively homogenous in the 20th century uh, under the uh, influence of uh, Greek national projects. So, what was, was the new mosque? The new mosque was a unique space, uh, and uh, indeed I won't be able to get into all the detail that I would like here. I will say parenthetically that yesterday on our workshops visit to the cathedral mosque here in uh, Moscow, I was rather fascinated to find a postcard. They have an exhibition in the Museum of Islam at the cathedral mosque. They have, a, they have an exhibition of postcards from different uh, Muslim sites sent to, uh, sent to uh, Muslims in in Moscow, and one of them was indeed from the early 20th century of the new mosque. But the new mosque was not exactly a mosque for Muslims. So what do I mean by that? One of the unique communities in Thessaloniki was the so-called Denme. The Denme were followers of the 17th century self-proclaimed Messiah, Sabatesevi, who was indeed originally from Edirne, but settled for much of his time in Salonika, he proclaimed himself a Jewish Messiah. 
and indeed they were of a Jewish background, but under duress late in life, Sabatai Sevi converted to Islam, so all of his followers also converted to Islam. This community continued to exist throughout the Ottoman times as what are sometimes called crypto-Jewish Muslims, but they were defined under the Milet system of the Ottoman Empire as Muslims, and so therefore they worshipped in mosques. This lovely uh, building uh, that combines Art Nouveau and, uh, and sort of Neo-Moorish uh, architectural elements, and I definitely recommend visiting it if you can in Thessaloniki, was built in the early 19th century, 1903, I believe, uh, in order to service the Denme community, but only was actually function, functional as a mosque for about 10 years because the Balkan Wars, and then uh, in 1923, finally, the population exchange between the new Republic of Turkey and the Greek state of Muslims and Christians resulted in its uh, closure, its reopening as an archaeological museum, and now uh, an occasional uh, exhibition space owned by the municipality of Thessaloniki. So, is it a mosque? <laughs> well, those are the open questions that I won't provide any answers to. I take it that I'm about at time, or do I have... Uh, I, I, I don't need to speak at any greater length, probably, uh, I, I, since I've already traveled with you to various sites. I just want to conclude by, again, provoking us to rethink what it is we mean when we say this is a mosque, precisely because, uh, uh, particularly in a space with a history as layered, as violent, and as multiform as the Balkans, but again, I think this applies across a wide range of geographies. Often, when we say we visit a mosque, we don't necessarily mean a building inhabited by the community of Muslims practicing it. Now, I, I think this is a, a really, you know, there are, there are many potentially troubling aspects to this, but I've given you uh, four images to conclude with, just to give you a sense of the sort of variations that I'm thinking about uh, on the upper, uh, I can never get my directions right with these PowerPoint presentations, but on the upper, uh, my right, your left, you have of course uh, the famous, perhaps most famous, uh, Al-Masjid An-Nababi Nabavi in Medina, the Prophet's Mosque, uh, one of the sort of uh, paradigmatic mosques, though very few mosques have that many minarets, if any, uh, that I know of. Uh, then, uh, moving clockwise, you have an architectural rendering of the Cordoba House Park 51 in downtown Manhattan, which of course never came to be, so in some sense this is a virtual rather than actual mosque. You have uh, an image from the book of one of the inspirations for much of my recent thinking in this way, uh, Azra Akshamia, a Bosniak uh, artist, activist, and theoretician who in her art practice creates what she calls wearable mosques that can be uh, taken on and off to create spaces of worship in different ways in, uh, in wherever one might be, and I highly recommend looking up that book. Uh, it's called Mosque Manifesto, in fact, so in some sense uh, raising a lot of the same questions. Finally, another site that I've done a little bit of research on, though not so recently, the second, well, second or third, depending on one's criteria of enumeration, the Rijeka Mosque in Rijeka, a port city in Croatia, incidentally also destined to be the European cultural capital of 2020. As you can see there, it looks as though it's descended from some space age future to, uh, to uh, alight upon the hills above the Gulf of Kvarna and the Adriatic Sea. So obviously, uh, you know, there's something perhaps banal and obvious about pointing out variations architecturally among mosques according to uh, different traditions uh, uh, geographically and one might say even civilizationally. And yet I think there's more to it when we think about them as spaces that embody these multiform, not always evenly distributed and yet laminated memories uh, that are sometimes collectively acknowledged and at other times uh, even repressed. So I uh, look forward to the discussion and thank you again for spending your Saturday night here with us when I know there are many uh, competing uh, and, and probably equally entertaining venues uh, in this city that could have, uh, could have attracted you. And the final talk, the final talk we are going to listen to you uh, is a talk by Katarzyna Puzon. Uh, she is from Germany too. 
uh, from the Humboldt University, and her talk will be devoted to the heritage, memory heritage, in Beirut and Berlin, uh, the visual heritage of these two very different and, on the other hand, very similar cities. So, Katarzyna, the floor is yours. Thank you. And once again, I will remind you that we do have translation into Russian, and we do have headsets for simultaneous translation over there. Um, so thank you so much uh, again, Dima and uh, Lidi, for having me here, and Garage, and thank you to all of you who decided to spend with us this Saturday night, as Jeremy has just uh, mentioned. I'm going, I've slightly changed the subject of my talk because I thought I would just be more uh, Muslim focused than I intended initially. And um, so, so instead of visuality and materiality, visual materiality will be in my talk, but uh, the focus will be more on different articulations of Muslim space in Berlin and Beirut. And I will be reading quite slowly with, uh, because we are having an interpreter here. So, material and immaterial and visual cultures of cities provide insights in, and information about the complex histories and layers of time. What readings of the past and the present day offer in Beirut and Berlin? How does this play out in terms of imagining and thinking about cities recognized for their diversity and known for their wartime legacies and ongoing forms of migration? Reflecting upon these questions and taking into consideration recent developments and changes in the social landscape of both cities, my talk deals with these questions and explores um, Beirut's and Berlin's articulations of Muslim space. So I will first talk about Beirut, um, providing some background information and subsequently focusing on Beirut central district uh, that transformed into the epicenter of the city reconstruction of the, after the end of the civil war in 1989-1990. Um, yeah, two years. In Beirut, everything is very complex. I will just uh, discuss later why and how. The second part of my contribution is dedicated to the practices of ISLAM, uh, a Berlin-based art collective of young Mar Muslim artists who have created a space within and through which uh, they voice questions of belonging and identity and negotiate their place in Berlin as well as in Germany at large. So starting with uh, Beirut, um, quite a general picture and some background information. Uh, so narratives of Beirut uh, offer various images representing city, a city's diversity. And these are illustrated by many names that Beirut has earned, such as the Paris of the Middle East, a meeting point between East and West, or a Phoenix city. As anthropologist Chris Tilly um, points out, here I'm quoting him, by the process of naming places and things, they become captured in social discourses and act as mnemonics of the historical actions of individuals and groups, end of quote. In Arab novels, for instance, Lebanon's capital has been depicted for example, as an ever-changing metropolis. This image is emblematically portrayed in Elias Khoury's novel entitled The Journey of Lita Gandhi. And underpinned by historical accounts, Khoury's book tells, tells us a story of pre-war, wartime, and post-war Beirut that highlights its relentless alteration, as is exemplified by Sahat Ashukhada marches square. So you can see three photo, you can see three images here. Uh, yeah, I also have problems with directions always. So here you can see Beirut, the, the central square, marches square in Beirut uh, in the 60s. There you can see it uh, at the end of the 80s, so close to the end of the war. And here is the image from 2000. So Probably you can identify that in all those images, the, something that is quite stable in terms of remaining there is the martyr square. I don't know if you can see the statue of martyrs. Can you see the statues of martyrs? Like in the middle there, there, they're quite hidden behind uh, trees 
and over there. So this portrayal of um, Beirut's relentless alteration also resonates with Beirut's deeply ingrained conviction that the city never dies. So, um, and the popular analogy to a phoenix repeatedly rising from the ashes uh, testifies to that presumption, along with setbacks and advertises, adversities that the city has endured. Uh, also, these images reveal much about Beirut's materiality and history. Indeed, a full understanding of the city, as is probably the case of many, if not all, cities, is impossible without a closer account of its urban texture. And now I'll give it to some background about the war, which is kind of important here. So the Lebanese Civil War um, lasted 15 years. It started in 1975 and finished in 1989-1990 and divided the city into formerly Christian East and Muslim West. Although this division it wasn't that clear-cut. There, there were more problematic issues. A clear-cut in the sense of religion. So although like formally it was East, Christian East, uh, Muslim West, obviously not all people living in the West were Muslim and not all living in the, Christ, in the, in the East were Christian. But I, I don't, I don't want to go into, into that. But this is how it formally functions. In the aftermath uh, of the war, discussions over Beirut's reconstruction focused on the city center. Um, and the reason for, for that was that the post war, that this was the, the, um, the site that had been a major battle zone during the civil war, and as such had been most uh, civilly affected during the war. Um, also, the area has the highest concentrations of heritage sites and structures in the city. And the, therefore, the policy of the restoration of those sites and those structures was, uh, there were lots of heated debates around that and was subjected to harsh criticism coming from different sites. And the material intervention in Beirut's historic core affected 8% of the buildings, although only a third of them had been destroyed during the war. Uh, this included migration to the suburbs of and other parts of, uh, of the metropolis of those who lived there during the war and before the war. So wartime newcomers, those who moved to the city uh, center, because there were not all, always fights throughout those 15 years, uh, were evicted and long-term residents were forced to sell, sell their properties for relatively low prices. Uh, a long-time ardent critic of the reconstruction project and one of the most prominent Lebanese architects, Azim Salam, argued that the town's, quote, I'm quoting him now, the town center has become a dead city, an empty field open to the speculative ambitions of developers. For example, uh, he accused the leading Sunni organization Dar al-Fatwa of architectural Talibanism. And here he was referring to the destruction of, uh, of the Bamayan statues in Afghanistan for the renovation project of the Al-Omari Mosque. And this is Al-Omari Mosque. So what's a mosque? A mosque is a, ch is a church in Beirut. Okay, I will <laughs> explain why. Um, so, um, yeah, so Al-Omari Mosque is also called uh, the Great Mosque. And the question of Christian frescoes especially sparked a lot of controversies in that mosque, uh, as rumors were spreading that uh, uh, the medieval mosques that were covered and plastered inside the building, they were uh, destroyed while the building was being uh, renovated. So the mosque was originally built in the 12th century by the Crusaders as it's believed, and as a basilica dedicated to St. John the, the Baptist. Uh, and the apse, as you can see the apse, um, oriented towards the east, testifies to, to those origins. At the end of the 13th century, it was converted into a mosque by the Mamluks during the Islamic conquest, um, and named after their second caliph. And during the French mandate, its facade was redesigned and arcade was added to the mosque. In a, 2000, um, in a 2004 speech inaugurating the opening of the Alomari Mosque, Lebanon's uh, former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri 
who was assassinated in 2005, said that, maybe I shouldn't be adding it here, maybe I should add it later, because that's kind of relevant for mention, but he said that the Alomari Mosque in Beirut has a special importance for us, I'm quoting him, because it is the mosque of the Arab conquest and around, around it rose the town of Beirut. So in terms of emphasizing the importance of the presence of the mosque in the city center and the project of uh, 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 restoring that part of the city. There are multiple, often very conflictual narratives surrounding the history of the Alamari Mosque. So it's one, of, it's one of the narratives. Yet its reconversions exemplifies its strategic role as a place of worship and power, both spatially and sociopolitically. It used to be Beirut's main mosque and the most cherished Sunni place of worship. And now this role has been taken over by the Muhammad Alamin Mosque. And it's now the, the, mm, the largest uh, mosque in Lebanon. Uh, and the mosque is popularly, popularly referred to as the Hariri Mosque and is located in the southwest center of, um, of Martyrs Square. So Rafik Hariri, whom I've just mentioned, uh, now also considered as a, as a Martin after his assassination in 2005, uh, is buried just next to that mosque. You can also see him here, uh, he, images of, of Rahim Hari, like his face uh, over there. Um, he set up the Soldier Company in 1994, two years after his appointment to office. And the joint, that, that company was charged with the task of rebuilding the city center and restoring the city's normality, as they claimed. Uh, so built from 2002 until 2005 and opening in 2008, a neo-Ottoman architecture, I think I have like more, right. A neo-Ottoman architecture and with large blue dome and amber minarets, uh, its design resembles the Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Istanbul and is also popularly known as the Blue Mosque. So it is located right next to St. George, a Maronite cathedral. You can see it here, over there. Um, and the cathedral was built in, 19, uh, in 1894, at the end, of, the end of the 19th century, and was restored after the war as well, as it was heavily distracted during the war. Uh, destroyed during the war and reopened in the year 2000. The Alamin Mosque is, uh, has the same height uh, of the cathedral, cathedral though, though the, the domes make it higher, made it higher. So in response to that, the cathedral authorities decided to construct the campanile with church bells. So when there was a decision made to build the mosque, so this kind of competition between uh, uh, cathedrals, churches, and mosques in the, in the city center of Beirut uh, has been ongoing for a while and very much activated after, after the war. Uh, yeah. So just to conclude on Beirut, we can go back to, to that uh, later on, so you can you can you can see it better this mosque and how it's how it's exposed. You can see the cathedral just behind the mosque. Uh, I'm finishing on on Beirut um, with this slide because I would just find it really strange not to mention what is going on in Beirut now. So now the Martyrs Square uh, has turned into a site of protests that started last week after the government announced the plans to increase uh, taxes and not only on WhatsApp. So, because this is how it's probably announced that it's because of WhatsApp. That's why the Lebanese who are very much regarded in the region as, as those who like showing off with different things, including uh, yeah, social media and on social media. Um, so now Be Beirut is uh, demonstrating there. Um, and what is quite different this time when it comes to the, those protests, uh, this division, this competition between different religious denominations is not really taking place. And it's a very different kind of characteristics when it comes to Beirut, when you look at even those competitions and contests for visibility in terms of religion and sectarian affiliations, 
as the example of the cathedral and this mosque and as, as the example of Al-Omaria Mosque. So uh, hopefully with the benefit of insight and with some experience. But the references to the war are still taking place. So this is uh, on Beirut. And now I'm, so it's, it's a very different kind of perhaps characteristic of Muslim space in terms of not necessarily focusing specifically on one structure or very, yeah, or very much limited idea of, uh, yeah, of space. But we, I can go back to that later, later on as well during the Q and A session. And um, and I'm, I would like to move to Berlin. And some of you, those who have participated in the workshop, might be experiencing a sort of déjà vu, <laughs> because I will be kind of repeating myself in a way. But um, decided to downplay with with a theory and academic structure of that talk. Uh, right. So I'm going to talk about uh, different kind of. Muslim space, so to speak. Um, yeah, so this is Islam. And Islam is a Berlin based collective of young artists who perform slam poetry. And slam poetry is a, is a f I don't know if you're all familiar with what slam poetry is. So, a slam poetry is a form of performance poetry that combines the elements of performance, writing, competition, and audience participation. So it is, it's a sort of poetry contest in which young people, uh, in which young spoken artists, uh, or those who identify themselves as artists or creative people, as they call themselves, uh, perform self-written lyrics on stage. And Islam does not identify itself as a religious or a political association or group. All organizers are Muslims, but not all participants um, those who participate in the events in contests um, see themselves as see themselves yeah, are Muslim. <laughs> they also organize workshop um, that that group. They also uh, organize workshops and public events, uh, both inside and outside of Berlin. So they have different groups with whom they collaborate, also in Switzerland and in Austria. And um, they address what they address in the. Um, in the work are issues of racism, Islamophobia, as well as sex, sexism. Um, and in 2015, they established the Islam Art Prize, which was followed by a series of workshops and the final well-attended ceremony uh, during which the prize was awarded. So the group started um, the activity in response to the controversial book formally translated into English, although it's never been the title has been translated into English. I mean, there is an English title, but the book has never been translated into English. Um, Germany abolishes itself, how we are putting our country at risk. So it was published in 2010 um, by Thilo Saratin, former Senator of Finance for the state of Berlin. And it was heavily criticized for racist and Islamophobic statements. I'm mentioning because this is how uh, this is what they emphasize when they talk about the beginnings of their activity. So by addressing those issues, the questions of uh, Islamophobia and racism, they believe to have filled the gap in the community uh, because they address mostly young people, although not exclusively, and they are kind of novelty on the German uh, poetry slam scene that is characterized by a strong presence of poetry slammers who are academics. And the idea of empowerment is behind the activity um, to encourage young Muslim people to raise questions that are important to them, those that I've just mentioned. And one of the motives is, is quote, our stage is for those who have something to say, or we do not do this for ourselves, we do that for what comes after us and what came before us, and here this, this this here is this reference to his heritage and how the activity is involved in the processes of heritage making and place making and space making in Berlin. Um, what is quite important in terms of the, as they describe it, Muslimness, I mean, as I would describe Muslimness, but the, what's important with reference to Islam to them is the question of the ego. So the idea of the ego taking over 
is regarded by them as a potential danger. And having this ego taking over would be contradictory to an Islamic perspective. Right. <clears throat> and from the very beginning, Islam was a Muslim version of poetry Islam. And um, the events begin with a recitation from the Quran in line with uh, Islam ethics. And this could probably fall within the category of halal arts. And um, here I'm referring to Jeanette Jolie's term. Uh, and Kirat uh, recitations, also translated as readings, constitute an old, well-established tradition in the Islamic culture, as well as story storytelling. And this is... Uh, this is what's very important uh, to them. This is this reference to poetry Islam. Um, hence the formulation is ich, ich Islam, so wherein Islam means participating in Islam poetry, translated into the English language, gives uh, or gave them Islam, which resonates with Islam, of course. So by writing it with a comma between I and the capitalized S, the name would refer both to um, Islam, I always confuse it with Islam. Now I keep saying Islam instead of Islam, sometimes I say Islam instead of Islam. Um, so to Islam, both to Islam and both to Islam in terms of Islam. Um, so making it quite catchy. And this is when, when they came up with that kind of idea, this is how um, the vision and the image and the idea uh, of the collective was sparked. So um, the word Islam, as I've mentioned, reflects the activity in terms of the involvement in Islam poetry, but it's also very relevant to, with respect to Islam itself, because as Yusuf uh, very proudly pointed out, I think a couple of times during our conversations, it refers to the beginnings of Islam. So the first Quranic verse uh, revealed, which started with the word Ikra, which means to... I mean, not, not to recite. Um, so, in their activity, collective created what they called a symbiosis between the heritage and ancestors' legacy, and a modern form and a way of making poetry, and creating their sense of belonging to the cultural scene, but also to Berlin through that poetry and within community. They are not, however, concerned with Islam only or even primarily. Religion as such is not that often openly addressed in their poems. What interests them more is the question of being Muslim, in particular in Germany, and belonging, and the questions of belonging to that Germany. Some per, uh, yeah, right, so here, how much time do I have? Five minutes. <laughs> it's always five minutes. So, um, when, because I mentioned the questions of belonging, what is uh, very much particular is discussions around Heimat that is, has, is experiencing its kind of revival in a critical term, but also in a non-critical term, I would say. So, I would just refer to kind of one discussion that I ha have had with Yusuf. Um, and... Uh, so, having had a look at one of the exhibits in Berlin's Museum of Islamic Art, Yusef said, uh, quote, it is always good to see Heimat. Heimat um, roughly means homeland, although it has no equivalent uh, in English. It can also mean a, a sense of belonging. So Yusef was there in that museum because of the Muslim cultural days organized by the art collective, his art collective. Of, his, of which he is a co-founder. The museum houses a large collection from the Middle East, including the legacy of the Umayyad dynasty. As he was heading towards the room where the event was to take place, he saw an exhibit from Damascus, the city regarded as the capital of the Umayyad Caliphate. The purpose of that event was to discuss art and ways of its understanding in the, pra in the practice of uh, Islam, in the practice of Muslim Islam poets, it's a ways of understanding of art. And by Heimat, Yusuf meant Syria, where he was born. He considers Aleppo his first hometown, 
And now also Berlin is his hometown, another heimat, so to speak, where he has been living for 17 years. Um, and coming back to the word heimat, so it's, it's, it's often linked with the German, German is Nazi era and regarded by some ex, as exclusionary uh, and has a contentious history and has become a quite problematic construct, as I've just mentioned. Uh, however, there have been attempts to reclaim the idea of Heimat, and some propose it's used in the plural form, for example. Uh, and the, some heritage institutions, uh, such as the Museum of European Cultures, a neighborhood urban and national institution based in Berlin, uh, that has recently launched the project Give Us Your Heimat. And the idea was to collect Heimat, and the plural of Heimat, uh, from visitors who could just provide the thoughts and reflections on this somewhat controversial term. Sam proposed the idea of Beheimatung, which denotes a process, uh, a feeling at home, encompassing belonging and being at home not defined by the place of origin, instead of using the plural term or instead of using, rejecting it as such. To Yusuf, however, uh, the word Heimat is a very important word, as a German Muslim, um, and he regards his place of origin, Aleppo in Syria, as a vital part of his identity. Um, as, I men as I've mentioned, he's been living in Berlin for 17 years, and he moved with his family when he was 10 years old. Uh, Yusuf sees Islam as his religion, not his culture, as he... Um, Repeatedly says, I have Arabic culture and there's a lot of German culture in me, and very often he laughs too much of it. So, to him, Heimat is primarily his place of birth, which impacted strongly the first 10 years of his life. He speaks of Germany as Heimat too. Yet, as he highlighted once during one of our conversations, meetings, when I am in German and this German tells me that I'm not German, I do not feel German. So heritage to Yusuf and his sense of belonging that I consider as part of heritage making and uh, referring to your, uh, to your heritage as a person is also more of a legacy that he carries and sees as empowering, which resonates with positive and liberating associations of that heritage or heritage as such. In other words, it refers to the idea of heritage that is not baggage and not a burden. And he highlights is a play space. I kind of differentiate, thank you for introducing this, introducing this distinction between place and space, but sometimes they kind of overlap. So yeah, kind of here I would, I would, I would see it as, as sort of synonymous. I mean, in this, in this idea of, um, of Heimat, uh, where there's, a, there's also room for his Muslimness. So I, I've come to an end. Um, I've tried not to include too much academic terms, <laughs> too much academic, so maybe it was kind of, I don't know how you, 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 um, you kind of took the, that juxtaposition, my intention, maybe it's, it's, it didn't really work out, was um, to discuss Muslim place and how it plays out very much differently in Be Beirut and Berlin. Um, although, to be honest, my work on Beirut wasn't really concerned with Islam. My work on Berlin is very much concerned with Islam. <laughs> what a contradiction. One might expect something, something different. Um, so that, question, that discussion on mosques uh, is not something that I did for my former work. So through that juxtaposition of Beirut and Berlin, rather than the comparison, so my intention wasn't to compare those two cases, so I've attempted to examine two different articulations of Islam in these two urban settings. And while in Beirut, uh, those articulations revolve will revolve primarily about place and visibility in the urban landscape. Those in Berlin concentrate on migration and belonging that are intertwined with questions of inclusion and exclusion as well as those of visibility and invisibility. Thank you.
Жена, спасибо. Значит, Катерина, спасибо очень. Пожалуйста, видите, I would like to invite all of our speakers here to the stage for us to discuss uh, these talks, and maybe you would like to ask your questions, maybe you have some thoughts or comments about what you've heard, or maybe some of the things are still ambiguous for you and you want to clarify them. I think it was the idea, by the way, of the speakers to leave it up to you, so if you have any questions, please, you're welcome. Uh, we will bring you a mic. Please raise your hand. Any comments или, uh, or вопросы? questions? Um, okay, thank you for all the three super interesting presentations. Uh, actually, I have a question to our first presenter, to Mania. I was, I was, that was a really brilliant presentation, all this conception of Dubaization. I, I kind of uh, experienced the same in, in Dagestan, like very often this inspiration, so I could see many parallels. But I was wondering, uh, do you also, did you also take into account, did you ask this local, this businessman, this Tajik businessman, I mean, or migrants in Dubai about if they pay zakat or how, this, how is this money transfer? Like, did you also use the, this conception in this placemaking um, concept, like, because that's also interesting if they, for example, if they pay it at all, and if they pay, do they pay to the Tajik communities in Tajikistan? Or rather, they would support the local uh, Tajiks who are poor and, well, and, uh, and uh, poor enough to receive zakat. Русский можно, конечно, а, вопросы, да, да. И... Мне интересовалось вопрос. Не, 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 не. А, можно, okay. я сказал по-русски. Okay. <laughs> should I respond now, or should we collect? Yeah, yeah. You respond now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you. It's a good question. And um, I observe three strategies. The one is that they give zakat in the local mosque in Dubai. So, because if they are there during the holidays, for example, to the Ramadan, what they sometimes do, but often they go home and they give it there. Or, as maybe the example of this Arab mosque is good, because this is also a form of zakat. So this, um, the Dubai businessmen, they give it, yeah, and then they give a lot of zakat, and then you can build a mosque. So, but maybe not a third is not a strategy, but is not giving zakat. And this is interesting because um, the Tajik women with them talked a lot, always told me that their, ma that their husbands don't give zakat, even if they perceive themselves as very pious Muslims. And this is what, this was interesting. It came up when we had the discussion about taking the second wife. So this kind of um, the new piety Tajiks engage in Dubai always uh, also um, integrates the idea of poly, polygony. It means taking a second wife or a third wife as part of uh, showing oneself up as a good, as a proper Muslim. And the women often told me that they do not really like the, the idea of taking a second wife because the husbands even did not pay the zakat yet. So they should firstly pay the zakat and then take the second wife. So this is how I came across with, with the zakat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My question is to Dr. Walton, please. <laughs> um, and uh, the question appeared because of the last slide from your presentation. So, uh, and so thinking of a mosque as a place different from what you've got used to, uh, do mean that there is a tendency in, I'm not sure whether anthropologists are talking about tendencies anyways, so uh, that there is a tendency of changing uh, the traditional mosque look, or do you just um, want us to think of the diversity that exists according to the past cir circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, that gives me an opportunity to say a bit more than I was able to during the presentation exactly, uh, which, is, which is always welcome. Uh, I, I'm actually, even as I was presenting the material, reflecting on some of the consequences of the argument that I was forwarding. 
Obviously, no one would be surprised to learn that there are multiple architectural traditions, multiple sizes, multiple differentiated communities that have occupied or not occupied mosques in different times and places. Uh, so that's not exactly a, a new observation uh, on my part. What I think I really want to emphasize is that mosques and indeed religious architecture in general and, and indeed architecture in general has a unique capacity to play a role as, as this type of site of memory and really to sort of forward that, uh, that's, that focus which hasn't really existed in the anthropology of Islam or architectural history as far as I'm aware. I have to do a bit more reading on that. But another thing that I think is worth pointing out, although it's not directly related to your question, is that there's something particularly sharp about the politics and processes of memory in relation to spaces and places in contexts where Muslims, and this would of course apply to other communities, religious and, and, and otherwise, where they're in a minority context. So each of the three uh, sites that I discussed, and indeed in some ways each of the sites also uh, discussed by Katarzyna and Manya, involve questions of religious minorityhood, inter-religious interaction. In the case of Dubai, of course, it's more, uh, I suppose, inter uh, I don't know if you would call it inter-ethnic or international, uh, but, uh, but that these questions become really central vis-a-vis -vis the places that Muslims occupy when there is a sort of sense of diminishment or even threats to the community. So that was also part of the argument. Uh, I do think that there are very interesting uh, both conservative and progressive uh, trends architecturally, and the last slide that I showed with Azra Akshamiya's flocking mosque, I really, I can't recommend her work enough. She's really doing a, a, a wonderful, both critical and artistic intervention into what we think of as a site of worship and the body of worship for, for Muslims. So I think there, there, that is happening. Uh, I, I only know a little bit about it myself, and I hope to learn more as well, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. А у меня... Э, а, у Лили есть вопрос. Лили. Да, это работает, да. Спасибо большое за эти очень интересные презентации, которые очень хорошо работают вместе, я думаю. И у меня есть вопрос для Джереми и один для Мания. Так, может быть, для Мания я думал о мечтах о Дубае, a dream <laughs> of a Muslim life, and whether some Muslims, Tajik Muslims, may be more critical of this uh, Dubai uh, destination, and uh, why would they be? So maybe they reject simply this uh, uh, attraction of Dubai, and why, uh, for what reasons? So I'm, I was wondering about these other Muslims, and to Jeremy, uh, this, so thinking of architecture in relation to sacredness, I was wondering if you looked uh, uh, in these studies you do, or in general in your interest for Muslim mosque architecture, if you have looked at sacred architecture and what, uh, how, uh, how maybe in the way these mosques change, it can be, way, it can be a question how to, um, what, I mean, how to maintain uh, this sacred <laughs> architecture if, if it was raised in some of the sites you visited, for example, and also in the sense of whether restoration uh, or reconstruction can be perceived as a loss of sacredness in certain places. I was thinking of uh, uh, pilgrimage sites uh, in Kazakhstan, the Ahmed Yassavi uh, mausoleum, which was uh, reconstructed in a very impressive way, but some people apparently felt that the abandoned, a more abandoned uh, pilgrimage site retained more sacredness and authenticity. So I was wondering about all these changes, uh, how they are perceived sometimes in relation to sacredness. Thank you. 
Um, Lily, thank you very much for this uh, excellent question because um, it gives us the possibility to complicate the picture a little bit. And indeed, there is a lot of criticism, but uh, I presented this uh, Dubai as a dreamscape as part of a powerful narrative the migrants tell. And it has to do with the idea that migration has always to be a story of success. So this is what the people bring with them when they go home and the, the photos they take and the pictures they take and they send home. Uh, so this is one aspect, what should be and what is idealized and what is uh, what is realized, not what is experienced as something different, but I would like to stay with the idea because um, against the background of what many Tajiks experience in their home country in Tajikistan, if you are a little bit more pious than the others and a little bit more deviant than the, international, uh, the national interpretation of Islam uh, tells you, you are really under suspicions and you become marginalized. So they have a kind of experience of discrimination and this is also what they experience in Russia. So going to Dubai is a kind of entering the paradise because they have a lot of opportunities to combine the business and the piety. So this dreamscape is a little bit also a kind of experience. But of course, when Tajiks are there and also other migrants who have a certain kind of image in their mind about Dubai, of course, they find themselves in a place which is not 100% Muslim every day, but there is a lot of prostitution and there is also corruption, of course, and they also told me about this, but it was not part of the official narrative. The same goes for Arabs. Arabs are kind of a sacred kind of people, but if you are a little bit closer with the people, they start talking about, ah, Arabs are really corrupted, but they would never tell it in the public or as, yeah, and also, when I started doing the, my, my fieldwork and I was not so familiar with the people, they repeated this as a kind of narrative. And I take this narrative seriously as something that leads me to understand why Dubai and why they go to Dubai. So, but of course, it's not 100% real. It's also maybe a kind of sacralization in a way of a place. Thank you, Lily. Uh, I will provide a very brief answer, but then I'm also going to use this as the opportunity to make a point that I wasn't able to in my, uh, in my presentation. So I hope you don't mind if I reopen uh, my PowerPoint briefly. If, that's, if I have the permission, if, uh, oh, I have, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's dark. <laughs> anyway, we'll see if it returns. It will be. Uh, so the, the, the brief answer is that the dynamic that you describe, at first I wasn't entirely sure uh, what you were pointing to, but now I understand. Uh, and I've observed it elsewhere. I think probably it's more common in relation to Torbe, Tekie, the sort of sites that Xenia, uh, one of the participants in our, com in our workshop, uh, discussed yesterday. I haven't encountered it specifically with regard to the mosques that I've discussed this evening or more broadly in my project. Uh, I also, you know, the, the sacred as a concept, whether one is uh, more Durkheimian or taking after Mersha Eliade is one that I haven't really uh, used in my work for a variety of reasons that we could talk about uh, uh, more separately. But what I do think is fascinating, and this is why it's somewhat tangentially related, but I didn't actually get to the point with this slide, which is that in the, uh, in the Denme Yeni Jami in Thessaloniki, Despite being a, a municipal art gallery, it has also been reappropriated by, uh, well, a combination of the sort of neo-Ottoman multiculturalist policies of the mayor of Thessaloniki, Yanis Butaris, and then Turkish state actors. So this slide is about the first namaz, the first collective prayer performed in this mosque in 90 years. Of course, the collective prayer that was performed was a Sunni, uh, you know, was a Sunni uh, Hanafi, uh, you know, Juma prayer. It had nothing to do with the sort of rituals that would have been occurring there when the Dönme were there, which were nothing like... Uh, 
uh, Sunni prayer. So, you know, the sacred isn't exactly the concept I've used, I would use, but really tracking the shifts in what type of religiosity can and cannot occur in these spaces is also quite interesting. It would be impossible to have a donme prayer in this mosque now because the donme no longer exists. They've been, uh, they've been uh, evaporated, as it were, sociologically and culturally. So, uh, I, I know that didn't really answer your question, but... <laughs> I have a question then. First, uh, thank you very much. I will be responsible for the Russian language. I will be the only person speaking Russian, but I will speak Russian because somebody has to speak Russian here, right? Now it's your turn to listen to the translator. So, I want to ask uh, the first question to Mania. I think it's one of the few uh, pieces of research that's devoted to migration in Central Asia, Asia beyond Russia. So, it's migration of the people from Tajikistan, not into Russia, but to other locations. And I wanted to ask you, what is uh, Tajik migration like in the Muslim context of Dubai? Because in Moscow, uh, we anthropologists also study the Tajik's communities here in Moscow, and we know that they, both in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in different Siberian cities, as far as I know, as far as I can see, the Tajik community creates a very rich ta Tajik infrastructure, and it's not just kind of Tajik ethnic or national structure, it's a Muslim structure, infrastructure that they create. So, for example, the representatives of the local Tajik community are very important religious people that are important figures for the whole, for the context of the of Islam, I would say, of the whole Muslim world. So, what happens there in Dubai? Do the migrants form their own communities the way that um, they create their communities, they foster their communities in the Russian cities? That's the first question. The second question will be to Jeremy. Thank you very much for your talk, because really I've seen very few pieces of research which are somewhere in between art history, architecture history, and anthropology at the same time. So it was important for me uh, to see how we try to rethink the Muslim architectural heritage. I think it's really cool. It's really great. Thank you. I think it's really an important thing for the Russian context, too. It's an important research for Russia, what a mosque looks like, basically, because we, yesterday we went on a tour in the cathedral uh, mosque here in uh, uh, Moscow together with Marat Safarov and he said that the minarets are kind of reference to Suyumbike's towers in the Kazan Kremlin and this portal is a reference to Samarkand uh, to uh, the Central Asian Middle Ages architecture then uh, Ivona asked where is the Northern Caucasus the Northern Caucasus Asian architecture, then he said it's not present, unfortunately. So, anyway, these intricacies of architecture, they, it's, they are very important, and this kind of mixture of different architectural uh, facets is very important. What was interesting for me was Zagreb's situation, and you told, said that it was demolished, right? And the minarets were demolished. Why is it still called a mosque? Though it's an exhibition center, as you said, it's a museum, and how is this place perceived by the locals and do the locals know anything about the history of the place although it used to be a mosque uh, how many years ago five six years ago so okay yeah this work yeah um yeah again this uh, visibility and invisibility this is also an issue that really yeah, I don't know. I mean, it is also fascinating for me to see. And uh, I must say that it was it's the first time that I did a translocal uh, field research, a translocal ethnographic field research. It means I did field work in different places. And this is fascinating, but it also has its limitations because you have to focus yourself on a particular group and you follow this group. But you don't have the time and the capacities uh, for doing a comparative approach. And this is what um, is really helpful to understand why I would say that the, the Tajiks in Dubai and the way they are visible still or they want to be invisible is something 
specific Tajik, while other things can also count for other Central Asians in Dubai. But if we compare it with, for example, the Kyrgyz and the Uzbek, they are very visible. They have also ethnic restaurants in Dubai, but not the Tajik. So I was really wondering why they are so visible in Moscow and in Russia, but not in Dubai. And I think it has to do with their um, language skills. They speak Arabic, they speak Persian, and they are able to cross over the ethnic boundaries of the networks and experience a kind of social mobility they would never experience in Russia because they are limited to the Tajik, to the ethnic networks. And this is something that pushed them forward to, to do this and to, to find their ways into these business fields and to do business with Iranians and with Afghans to, learn, uh, to make a um, huge amount of money to become socially mobile and to are able also to overcome this, uh, this touchiness as a kind of identity that stigmatizes them in many, many different contexts. So they become Muslims and not, they are no longer touching. So it has something very attractive for them. Yeah? And I would say this is the reason why they are not so much interested to create a kind of community identity and to make a place as a community because they want to try find, to find a way out of this community. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, this I get it. The, the answer I would like to give at the moment. Uh, thank you, Dima. I'm going to yet again rely on my slides if it returns. Uh, uh, thank you for your kind words. I'm glad to hear that you feel that there's a resonance uh, in Moscow, and I hope that there would be resonances elsewhere. I was personally quite fascinated by the attempt which was both admirable but indeed partial to incorporate different elements of what might be considered a sort of Russian spa spatial Islam in the cathedral mosque yesterday. The mosque in Zagreb is, uh, I shouldn't really call it a mosque, though that is indeed what it's, what it's called, is a fascinating case, but it, it, this allows me uh, to, to make a point that I, I wanted to make, <laughs> I, I keep saying that in response to questions, in, in, my, in my presentation, which is that we can think of language also as a medium of memory in, in a way parallel to built environments, right? And in this case, language is in fact vernacular language of Croatian, Serbo-Croatian, as I continue to call it, I seem to be the only one in the world, uh, <laughs> is, is actually a a more profound medium for collective memory of the space as a mosque than architecture is, because architecturally there's no cue to it. It has, been, I mean, there's actually been a lot of controversy over a rec recent renovation, which has nothing to do with the history of its use as a mosque. It has to do with the rather authoritarian, neoliberal sort of interventions of the current mayor of Zagreb, uh, Bandic. But that's another story. Uh, yet, uh, so I think if it weren't the case that it were, was still referred to constantly as John that memory would have faded. Now, I don't, you know, I've, I've pressed this on a couple of occasions and no one can ever tell me much beyond the fact that they know it was a Jamia. Most people have some sense that it was a Jamia during, uh, a mosque that is, during, uh, during the fascist era. And that era is, of course, a time that is itself very difficult to handle in terms of the politics of collective memory in Croatia today. On the one hand, it was, of course, during socialism, totally, uh, totally uh, uh, vilified, and rightly so in my mind. But now with the sort of new nationalism in Croatia, there's more of an openness, sadly, in my opinion, to the fascist era than there should be. And actually, uh, an interesting effect of that is that this postcard that you have here, uh, I purchased it at an antique market in Zagreb. It was, it's the most expensive postcard I've ever purchased. And the reason that it was so expensive, uh, I asked the vendor, he said, well, anything from that era has gotten really expensive. Any material artifact, because there's now this right-wing nationalist sort of revival in fascist memorabilia. And this counts as fascist memorabilia, interestingly enough. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating and disconcerting case, indeed. Спасибо. Так. Uh, да, Hello. Can you hear me? I will support Dima and will also speak Russian. 
Uh, thank you very much for your talks. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I think you share a very interesting approach to the Muslim studies because the Russian academia is very different from the Western academia, I would say. So our approaches are very different from the Western approaches. So for us, it's extremely interesting to listen to you, how you see the history and what kind of questions you raise uh, as researchers. I have a question to Katarzyna, if you don't mind. Uh, Germany, uh, yeah, your talk was really very interesting. And since nobody else asked you a question, I'm going to do so. So I think Germany uh, has faced a lot of migration from Muslim countries, a lot of uh, migrants from Turkey, right? So we know uh, that in uh, Germany there are a lot of migrants from Turkey. I'm just waiting for Не, не надо ждать, просто говорите. So, in Germans, there are a lot of migrants from Turkey, uh, also Muslims. Germany knows, has known Islam for quite a lot of time. So, as you see it, are there any differences in the perception and maybe in the representation of the Muslims, of the Muslim community, after uh, the number of migrants from Syria and other Arab countries increased? Because Turkey is a secular state, right? After all, and... Uh, uh, Turkey represented itself as a secular state, uh, distancing itself from Islam. But the Arab states, even in the area of Pan, uh, in the Arabic moods, uh, still are closely connected to Islam, to the religion. So these new migrants uh, of the past five, seven years, did they create new discourses around Islam and around the Muslim religion? Thank you very much. So your, your I'm, I'm not sure whether if I understood correctly, but your question would be about the reception from the Turkish community of those who res recently arrived in Berlin. Uh, in terms of religion, you mean? Yeah? Or... So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, about Islam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, um, there are very different layers. So first of all, when it comes to the Turkish community at large, um, I wouldn't describe it as secular in Germany, so there are obviously diversities. I wouldn't also describe very much so, but we have an expert on Turkey sitting here, so maybe he can add something more on that in terms of Turkey being a secular state and how it projects itself as being a secular state. Exactly, but that's, that's really, really complex. So, um, so maybe I would just say more about the reception in terms of uh, Islam and the, those who, who arrived recently um, in Berlin and in, in Germany, of course. So, of course, a new, again, Islam became um, the topic in Germany because of that. Uh, so obviously it's affected the discourse of Islam, of Islam in society. Uh, I was referring to that infamous book that was published before the arrival of, uh, uh, before the so-called refugee crisis. So I wouldn't say that this, those controversies around Islam started with, with the refugee crisis, but obviously uh, uh, those discussions became much more heatedly debated on different uh, levels. From my work, for example, with... Um, so I, I, I've, I've been working... Islam is just one focus of my work, uh, but I, I've also worked with uh, museums and different projects, um, artistic projects, cultural projects, people involved in collaborations with uh, cultural institutions and with um, refugees. So the question of Islam is not present there. So it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's silence, maybe it's just too, because silence can be understood also like kind of repressed. So I wouldn't say it's repressed, I would say it's not very much present. So it's more discussions are around the questions of belonging, migration, refugeeness, referring to the German past, uh, and there's this whole debate of welcoming. 
so um, welcoming refugees in Germany. So there's this kind of trying to, to build this kind of image of Germany being very receptive. How those people are um, respond to, to those, this is a, another kind of very complicated story. So it's not some of them uh, would like to have Islam more present in those projects and exhibitions, for example, because it's part of their identity. Of course, not all who who recently arrived in Germany are Muslim. So that's kind of also very, very important. And some of them wouldn't identify themselves as Muslim in terms of religion. There are lots of people also from Northern Iraq. So not only from Syria, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very heated debate. That's why the project I'm part of, it's called Making Differences in Berlin, uh, um, Museums and Heritage transforming museums and heritage for the 21st century. And one of the strands we are focusing is precisely on Islam. So one of the reasons why Islam is so much present in that uh, uh, is because there's so much discussion about the German, German heritage, questions of belonging, but also how those discussions are becoming problematic also in the representations um, of uh, Islam in, in, in German museums or not being very much present there or present in a very problematic way, for example, in ethnographic museums. So kind of our, I wouldn't say agenda, but our kind of belief is that those spaces can be very productive for addressing those uh, complex and very, very important issues. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, the manager is are telling me now that unfortunately our time is up and we have to finish here, have to wrap up here. I'm really grateful for you to you for coming. Thank you very much for staying till the very end of our discussion. And I think that every one of us had some analogies uh, in, in our minds uh, about the Russian context. So when we were listening to the experts, I'm pretty sure that we were all thinking about the Russian context and about the similarities we have here. I think all of these narratives, uh, they suggest actually a total new perspective on these important questions, issues, and I think it's one of the important meta goals of anthropology as such, to cast a new perspective, to uh, give a new perspective. Thank you very much, our dear speakers. Thank you.